Jules Parker from Hussey Hicks. Uh, welcome back to Australian Musician. Oh, thanks for having me back. And uh, Happy New Year to you. Um, tell me about your New Year's Eve. You had a, a gig, didn't you? Oh, we played a beautiful gig um, at Memorial Park on, in the entrance. Just a big, you know, fat free free show put on by, you know, JC Entertainment and the council. So everyone could just come and get amongst it. It was, they had a great turnout, a family, family friendly event. We finished at nine with the nine o'clock fireworks. So it was, it's really, really, really beautiful. Yeah. I, I guess in many ways you were glad to see the back of uh, 2022. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I, I still had a pretty great year. You know, we got to go, we got to do two European tours, which, we didn't get to do, you know, since 2019. So, yes, there was definitely definitely some challenges thrown at us in 2022. But I don't, you know, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of just hoping that the, the number on the calendar will change and everything will change. So, yeah, I just, you know, I hope we keep continuing along and, and I hope that we uh, don't see as much rain as we've seen in 2022, if that's for sure. Yeah, uh, for people who who don't know what happened, uh, you're up at the Northern Rivers and involved in yep. two major floods. Uh, yep. In 2022, and your studio got wiped out. Um, yeah, get... the room that I'm sitting in, actually, though, it you might if you, you know if you've got a very astute eye, you can probably still see tiny strands of spider web uh, that have caught the flood mud on the roof because yeah. we got most of it. But we missed a bit. Yeah, yeah, so it went right up over the ceiling here, and I'm. So how'd, yeah, you, the floor uh, how'd you go replace the yeah. gear, that sort of thing? Uh, it's, been, it's been a challenge. My microphone graveyard sitting in front of me right now and there's um, yeah, there's a, a very beautiful collection of broken microphones and that's probably been the, the hardest, you know, because you gather those things one by one over many years yeah. and trying to replace them all at once is quite the challenge. Yeah. yeah. And Ironically, uh, the week of the flood, you'd released a, a single, The Same Boat, uh, with a game featuring you guys in a boat trying to get a gig. <laughs> oh, get yep, it was actually the, the, the Monday that it went to radio, uh, Monday morning, yeah, as, as, as the sun rose on that same morning, we were, uh, yeah, sit, sitting in kayaks, um, <laughs> trying not to drown, and... Uh, yeah, the irony was quite crazy because in the video game we're paddling and avoiding obstacles in the river, and I ended up having to paddle upstream because I knew our neighbour would um, wasn't as well prepared with say kayaks and boats and was a fair bit older than us. So yeah, it was pretty crazy coincidence. But anyway, yeah. uh, it's a great EP. Uh, it's called Same Boat. Um, I'm going to talk about another track on on the EP. I'm not a dog, yeah. which features. Yeah. A very heavy guitar riff. Uh, how did that riff come about, and who who are some of your heavier influences? Oh, I think well, Lisa wrote that main "I Am Not a Dog" sort of melody, and I was, I guess, being a you know '90s grunge kid, I was like, well, that's just got to be a chunky guitar riff that follows the melody, and um, yeah, um, my heavier. I mean, I was I, Tom Morello from Rage Against Machine was always someone I, I absolutely loved in that sort of realm. And, uh, you know, all that sort of, you know, sound garden-y 90s stuff resonated with me because that was when I was, you know, in school. But, yeah, and I just I just acquired an SG not long before that. So I thought I'd uh, drop, that, drop the Strat and the Telly for a minute and uh, go with something a bit chunkier. Yeah. yeah. Um, as you were saying, you, you did uh, get to UK and Europe a couple of times last year. How did the tour go? And did you go to towns you've been before or you, did you try different um, cities? It was mostly places we'd been before. I, the Both tours were kind of, you know, we, we had two very full tours for the um, Gather Up the People album launch planned for September and November 2020, which obviously... Um, didn't happen so that uh this you know we we rescheduled all of that till 2021 and then that didn't happen and then we sort of took a stand back and and waited a bit to see if we thought 2022 could happen and um it did so we uh a lot of the places we'd been before which was great because we had 
you know, people, we actually had a, a bunch of people come out to our shows who hadn't been out since the pandemic. Um, you know, people got a bit scared or a bit tentative and, and yeah, the amount of people who were like, oh, well, this is our first show we've been to and we'd, we'd forgotten how important it is and how, how much we need this. But I guess the fact that we're a pretty grassroots band and, and our, our following, you know, we're pretty connected because, you know, we've been going there for many years and playing, you know, pretty intimate rooms and and you often end up, you know, face-to-face, -face, you know, talking to people after the show, you know, selling CDs or T-shirts nowadays and, so yeah, it was great because a bunch of people who hadn't been going to shows from their European, you know, favorite bands sort of realized we'd made such an effort. They they came out, which was good to see the music community starting to connect again. And you know, those, the people who go to shows, they the connectivity between audience members, and and that's how that's how our industry works. Is you know, people will go to a show and they'll talk to someone and go, I love this show. And I went and saw this other great band two weeks ago and they're still on tour. And I think that's something really important that we that we um we have to keep alive because a lot of you know, a lot of that community feeling was was broken in the in the years that no one could go out. You know, you weren't catching up and sharing new discoveries and meeting up with the people who aren't necessarily you know, the friends you'd invite to a barbecue, but they're the people you always see at shows. So yeah, yeah. yeah we, we had a great a great experience and a great year in that way that's why i can't necessarily just go wash my hands of 2022 because yeah there was some good stuff too uh, are you are you the kind of writers that can write on the road uh yeah well we um lisa particularly is great at that i um i i sort of formulate scattered ideas when i'm on the road i write and then you know put it together when i've got a bit of focused time but lisa we um we ended up uh, helping a friend, well, helping, he helped us too, but we got to uh, relocate a yacht of a friend of ours from, from Greece to Turkey. And um, because, you know, the budget airlines, we bought this tiny little guitar lele thing, a little Yamaha thing, which is great. And um, so Lisa wrote a bunch of tunes, you know, on the boat with that because, and they're different because it's tuned up at, you know, the fifth fret, so. So yeah, we actually um we actually probably there's probably you know five or six new tracks born out of that European summer. Yeah. Which we're looking to finally getting back, you know, the studio's now basically functioning again. I have um, you know, yeah, it, it's an ongoing process, but we we're definitely at the stage now where we can start uh throwing down some tracks and getting ready for the next release. Yeah. Um, you've got an Australian tour coming up and as part of that you're playing our Melbourne guitar show um, we've been trying to get you for some time uh, what have you heard about the Melbourne guitar show well all good things and um, you know I've had a bunch of our friends play over the years and so I've always been watching it you know with excitement from where we've been I, you know I'm a guitar geek so for me to be able to run around at a guitar show it's it's kids in a candy store type thing so, you know, and to be able to come and play with both the band and the acoustic format, you know, I always I, I always get a bit nervous and don't play as well at guitar shows, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Yeah. Have you played anything like that before where a big portion of the audience are musicians? Yeah, funnily enough, um, when we first started the Hussey Hicks sort of trip, I'd, because um, I grew up playing with Phil Emanuel, so that the sort of guitar geek world was a big part of my upbringing. Um, and one of our first uh, European tours were based around, um, we did the Tsatsana Guitar Festival and then we, uh, we, we've we done the Suave Guitar Festival and we, you know, so we've actually played quite a lot of guitar festivals over the years. It was sort of some of the first anchor gigs we did because from my past, that was where my connections were. So yeah, we've, you know, we've, we've, it's funny we sort of get away with it because I play decently enough and it's guitar focused enough but you know often you'll be standing there and it'll be you know these insanely good guitarists like you know Sylvain Luke or you know, jo John Jorgensen or Joe Robinson or Tommy Emmanuel or whoever the, the best people are at the time uh who's the who's the uh UK guy that everyone's frothing over uh 
why can't I remember? Anyway, it'll come to me as soon as the interview is over. But yeah, we've we've played a lot of guitar focus shows. Guthrie Govan, that's right. We played a double header with him in um in Fio uh, just near where they make Ferraris, Fiorano, perhaps. That was that was great. Yeah. Do you think the role of the guitar has changed in music in the last couple of decades? It's not so much about shredding anymore, is it? I think that music has um, it, it's broken away from the mainstream thing. Of course, mainstream pop doesn't have much shredding, and um, you know, yeah, and the stuff that makes the the news doesn't on the news, the TV doesn't. But um, also, you know, with the internet and ac access to things, there's so many niches. Like the shred, the shred scene is probably as strong as ever, but it's just reaching a, a target audience. It's not on the main the main uh you know main channels but also you know there's also a huge yeah I, I feel like it's just the diverse each little niche now is catered to whereas yeah in the 70s everyone did big rock guitar solos in the 80s everyone really took those solos and you know doubled the speed and then the 90s they went back to sort of half the speed of, of both the 70s and the 80s and you know I guess now there's there's just so many little pockets. So I think anything goes if you find the right people. Uh, so who were your guitar heroes growing up? Well, I've always been mostly affected by people I see live. I don't, I'm not a huge consumer of you know recorded media. Um, I wasn't as a child. I, but you know, so I, I was lucky enough to go see you know both Tommy and Phil Emanuel as a child. And, you know, Terry Murray from the Far Gone Beauties, who was a great session player from Sydney, he gave me some lessons. And, and then, so mostly mostly my, you know, closest influences were, you know, Australians. So Ian Moss, I've always loved his tone. And Jeff Lang, you know, what, what a brilliant musician to have in our country. And, you know, I've been so lucky to play so many shows over the years and same bill and, you know, try and ingest what he's doing but yeah as a child you know Phil Emanuel was one of my greatest heroes so being able to play with him was just ridiculous and, you know and through that I got into things like the Helicasters and um, you know obviously being my age the Gary Moore was huge with that still got the blues album and you know and I'd sort of come from listening to you know Peter Green and you know John Mayles Blues Breakers that had all the Eric and Peter Green and Jeff Beck and and that type of you know English blues stuff. So yeah, our Aldi Miola, I, I I got into his electric stuff for a while. Yeah, pretty guitar geeky stuff. But um, and then you know obviously I, I moved to Europe and then you get exposed to all this other stuff. So you know, Django, obviously you end up going, wow, what's this guy doing? <laughs> but yeah, um, that's probably them. Tell me about the guitar rig you're taking out on tour. Um, I have, as in the guitars or the pedals or both. The, whole, the whole shebang. The whole shebang, okay. It's the right, right audience. I, on the east coast of Australia, I um, I take more things because of the flying, which is um, I've got my Strat I've had since I was 13, which is like an 89 Strat Plus. It's always been my main electric, but then now for this tour, I'm bringing the SG, which is a Greco. Um, beautiful, beautiful Japanese SG copy. Went through the flood. So I'm Not a Dog is the only thing that got recorded before it was wiped out. But I've got a, a friend, uh, Watto, up here who makes Am Watts amps, beautiful amps. But he took the time to just fix the guitar. You know, all the bindings have come off, but he does woodwork. So it's back. that one's back in my rig. So I've got, yeah, I've got the Strat, the SG, and I've got a beautiful um, vintage Telecaster. So that's my sort of main electrics that I've been bringing. And um, Andy Allen made me a lovely, you know, Maiden Dreadnought, which has been my main acoustic for years. And I I use that with the sort of the Maiden pickup system and a, an extra magnetic pickup, which I run through the electric channel of my pedals. Um, which are, I guess we can go full geek mode, can't we? Because we're on this. <coughs> My electric channel goes uh, micro pog, 
into um i used two two, two tube screamers made by actually i got yeah jam pedals this is a they come out of greece Giannis um makes them actually i've got here is and here's the uh delay i use but i've got this delay llama so my my electric rig is two two jam a pog into two jam tube screamers they're slightly different a heavier and a more transparent one uh, into a delay llama which is all contained in a multi pedal then i go into a eddie heiselman keely trem reverb pedal which um i'm you know i met eddie in nashville and we got to jam and i had the prototype for a while so it's just it's great if the back line doesn't have reverb because I always like to have that Fendry reverb because I'm a Fender twin tragic from way back. So that's my, basically the sound. Then I, then my acoustic channel is just, it's just a boss octava, which if it's just the two of us, I'll sometimes chuck for a bit of fatness and another Dalai Lama. And all of that just goes through a, uh, yeah, a volume, volume pedal and a loop pedal, which I use very sparingly, but it, still ends up taking up space on the board but yeah uh, and then that got, I then that I'd like to use Fender valve amps you know or I've got a music man 212 HD and a music man uh, 112 RD the two, the, the 212 went through the flood and the and the 112 is sort of my small carryable amp yeah so I, I guess you're looking forward to strolling around the uh, the floor of the uh, guitar show. I, very much so. Yeah, I'll, um, it's always interesting to see what what things are out there. I'm actually I'm looking forward to catching up with Andy from Moztronics because I've I've been using a few of his pedals in the studio and we've been chatting about some of those things. I really like. He's got these sort of he's got this tube pre, sorry, yeah. Well, I've got the tube pre, but also the pedal version, which I've used a fair bit in, in the last few years on tour. Which yeah, so just meeting with up with people who are doing things more interesting things and working out you know, yeah. where else to take it is always fun. Uh, when you look back at Hussey Hicks' career, what are the most vivid uh, vivid memories? Um, well, I mean, when we go back to that very first European tour, um, you know, we didn't know if it would work at all. We're just, we're like, oh, well, we'll just go and see if, see if anyone likes this and, and, um, you know, bought a van, traveled around to a, the few gigs we had and then picked up a bunch more and included, you know, we started, we had that Tazana guitar festival and another guitar festival and a few other things. And then just sort of having it all work. And, you know, back then it was pretty much not the height of CD buying, but still way in the, in the time where people would buy CDs and just, yeah, we had a real, we, you know, I wasn't even sure. I was like, maybe if we do it for two or three times, we'll be able to break even and then it might work. And I think we pretty much broke even the first trip and went back three months later. And since then it's been, you know, a big part of our our our, um, our year's work. So I think just, just working out that we could do this little independent touring thing and be rewarded almost instantly was probably one of the main things for the, for the little Hussey Hicks project. And Lisa and I had both worked on different projects before. So having, having someone else, you know, drive, drive the train really made, it made it a smooth, a smooth transition and it just worked for us. We were lucky, you know, we start, I guess we'd done enough uh, development with the other projects we'd played that when we, we came together with that project, everything fell into place and we've, you know, we've been able to stay on the road for 17 years, you know, keep doing what we love, keep going back to places we've never been, you know, getting invited to festivals in places like Alaska is just a dream. And, you know, Italy, Sicily, we got, you know, taken down to Sicily to play a, two blues festivals and a, a jazz festival in one, and you're like, this is, it's just, you know, it's a great way to see the world and a great life. Yeah. Well, Jules, uh, we look forward to seeing you and Lisa as Hussey Hicks uh, in Melbourne at the Melbourne Guitar Show. Oh, I can't wait. Finally, we're doing it.